Hello friends, our casting has improved a lot and this time we're turning this wooden pattern into this heavy aluminium casting for the CNC machine. In the process, we're gonna give you 23 bite-sized tips for melting aluminium, doing great castings, all that kind of thing. Let's jump in. Let's start on a random note. Stop making muffins. Assuming you ever want to make any actual parts, you might as well start playing around with sand moulds right away. If you have a lathe, or there might be one somewhere in your future, you have a supply of free easy aluminium bar stock. You might not be making things to send people to the moon with this material, but it's so easy. Instead of pouring leftovers into a muffin tin, use bean cans, old paint tins, or industrial grade peanut butter containers like I am here. Pop them in a bucket of sand and fill away as smoothly as possible. It seems like a more useful use of spare material and you can always remelt it back down. To get much less defect riddled lathe blanks, you'll want to burn off all the plastic from the tins before you pour into them. To make them more useful still and more machinable, you can quench them and then heat treat them. There are a few easy tricks to avoid in complete fails like this, as well as partial collapses in the green sand. Let's start with the basics. It's made up of three simple ingredients, silica sand, bentonite clay, and water. Getting these in the right proportions is simple, but we've certainly managed to muck it up in the past. One tip here is to mix the sand and clay dry so you can weigh it, and another is to top the clay up every now and again because it does get burnt out with use. The water's just misted on until the sand's passing the so-called sausage test where you make a sausage shape and it doesn't break under its own weight. When it does break, it breaks cleanly. We've done a number of videos on the mulling machine, so we won't go on about that. Enough to say you can do all this by hand, it just takes longer. This tip is connected to the last. If you do it right, you can prevent dropout. It's easy enough to modify these flasks. I don't think I'll be using it again. So it's a complete mutant and it's made for this size of pattern. There's no fine joinery going on here, but there are a few important things to point out. Flasks that have relatively large surface area compared to their depth, like this one, are the ones most prone to drop out. Threaded rods like this can prevent that in two different ways, and I'll come on to those later. So here's the thinking. The aluminium is going to come down the pouring basin and sprue here. It'll run along these feeders and gate in in four different places into the void. We want it freezing from this side to this edge so that the feeders are the last things to solidify so that they're feeding in aluminium to the shrinking pattern. Hopefully that'll tend to want to happen anyway because the aluminium's being fed in in this direction. So the first aluminium in will be coming to this side. And so that will have the most time to cool as it contacts the green sand. But to try and make sure we want to add in a little chill. More on how that does or doesn't work later, let's get on with making the mould. This will be the top half or the cope. Why it's called the cope, I have no idea. When I first started casting, I used talcum powder as the parting dust because I read it somewhere. It works okay, but it makes everything stink and is full of perfume and other nasties. Much better to use just pure calcium carbonate that's a fine powder. The first green sand to go on wants to be the fine facing sand, which has already had the bigger particles sieved out. This is followed up with more of your regular green sand and then rammed down. I'm reliably told my ramming technique sucks, so I won't say too much about that, other than the rammers you use don't need to be anything special. You can even use your fingers to get into all the nooks and crannies, just so long as they're small enough and they have a rounded edge. Flat top rammers are okay right at the end, but if they're used in the middle of the mould, they tend to cause weak planes and therefore collapse. A good sand mould is about finding the sweet spot between an extremely well compacted, solid high tensile mould and one which has good permeability. 
As the extremely hot molten aluminium makes contact with the green sand, it vaporizes the moisture in the sand. And if that doesn't have anywhere to go, as in it can't pass through the sand, it will cause a kerfuffle in the casting itself. More clay content, harder ramming and finer sand, all of which seem to make a smoother, more impeccable, stronger mold actually reduce the permeability. Tip 8. Prepare for mistakes. Even if you've been doing this a while, it's likely you'll learn something new on each casting. In this case, it will become obvious to my previous self what I was doing wrong in just a moment. Before it does, let's sneak in another tip. This one's about the coating on the pattern. I've tried various different things. Some of the best seem to be thick proxy primer, which is good at covering over little defects and divots. Rattle cans of cheap, simple matte car paint, which seems to hold the parting dust quite well. I also like the traditional shellac finish, which is less noxious than the previous two. Oh, wow. <laughs> But shellac does tend to require a slightly finer finish on the surface of the pattern. To return to the mistake then, it wasn't necessary to remove this pattern before I'd rammed up the drag. And see those big gaping holes in the sand there? They're going to make it quite difficult too. So let's reverse a bit, screws out. We need to get the pattern back up and push those risers back in. Before I did that I had to cut them down a bit because they stuck up too high. All this up and downing and moving around of the mould is making me very thankful of the reinforcement, the threaded bars that are in there. They stabilise the whole structure a lot and they stop the walls of the flask moving in and out as you move it around, or indeed when you're ramming up, which tends to push the walls of the flask outwards. We've put the other half of the pattern in and now we're placing the runner which is basically like a corridor for molten aluminium. It goes all the way from the sprue down to the spin trap here. There's a couple of good YouTube videos already on spin traps and I'll link to them in the description. The basic idea is molten aluminium flies down the runner, spins around the trap at high velocity, centrifugally trapping any debris or sand that might get washed into it. This drag or what will be the bottom of the mould, is very shallow. Considering its surface area, this makes it very liable to drop out. Why have such a shallow drag? Well, on castings this size, if you don't, it just becomes impossibly heavy. To prevent certain dropout, we screw a ply base onto the drag, and from now on the sand should be completely supported. You could use to hoist of course, but with less sand in general, it takes less long to ram up the pattern and you don't have to have such a big stock of green sand. That was difficult. <sighs> the spin trap, lower part of the pattern and runner all get removed. It doesn't have to be particularly neat round the runner or trap just so long as there's no loose sand that's going to get washed into the casting. Then it's out with the risers and you can sort of see how the runner in the drag below will intersect with them. Now before removing the pan we need to cut the gates to actually let the metal into the cavity. I'm sure there's much better implements to do this with but it's kind of reassuringly and worryingly crude at the same time. The edges of all those transitions want to be smoothed off a little bit. There's much better implements again. Most people like a paintbrush to do this. Tip 12. Use compressed air or just blow on it to make sure there's no loose sand left in. Don't go too crazy and make sure you turn your regulator right down. Even if a few small edges do break off, a nice clean cavity bodes well for later. <laughs> We've made it this far, but it seems like an epic struggle to lift this onto here and place it nicely in these pins. Do I dare try it now? I guess it's quite late, <laughs> but I need to put it together so I can leave it overnight or it will dry out horribly. So... I guess we're trying this. <laughs> Tip 13. 
Well, this did indeed turn out to be a struggle, and for the love of all things reasonable, put hand doors on the flasks near the pins if you have to do this. I even had to cut some of this cack handery out, just it was so painful to watch. Kind of hysterical in its own way, but only once it was together. <laughs> uh. Tip 14. With it back together, we can make the pouring basin. This wants to be as near to an edge as practical so that the crucible can be low down and the spout can be right by it when pouring. We're cutting it with a pipe that's sharpened on the inside and marked up so I can see the depth. Here it is. I've covered up nicely for bedtime so hopefully it won't dry out overnight. It's not ideal because the wood here could warp and cup and that would be bad obviously. Tip 15. The alloy you use makes a huge difference. I've written a whole blog post on this which I'll link to in the description so I won't go into it too much in here just to say old alloy wheels are my favourite. They also often have their particular alloy printed on them. ALSI 11. It's been overnight. I'm realising I need to put vent holes in here. It's much better to put them in when the pattern's still in the sand but I forgot to do that. It's usual to jab the holes in with an old bicycle spoke or something similar, but without the pattern in, I'm afraid I'll cause cave-ins, so I'm using an old drill bit for that. I'm just hoping the upcuttiness of the drill bit will save the day versus the down pokiness of a spoke. On the subject of venting, notice the wooden battens we're placing this on and the air gap below them. More on that later. Let's light them up. Batman. Tip 17. This one's slightly controversial. Do a really snappy melt, de-dross, temperature check and pour. Don't spend time fluxing or degassing or other faffing about. The longer you spend with the molten material, the higher the chance the alloying elements will change their composition. I'll leave a link in the description to a video by LuckyGen1001 which convinced me that for the hobbyist, especially if you're starting with a nice alloy, it probably just isn't worth doing the fluxing and degassing. Tip 18. Preheat your crucible tongs. That'll stop thermal shock on the crucible. Preheat your temperature probe. Same. That'll stop self-destruction when you use it. Preheat the de-drossing spoon and the alloy that you're actually feeding into the crucible. That'll drive off all moisture and prevent explosions. 19. Do a dry run. This is as much a safety tip as anything. If you watch carefully, there is a lot going on and one little trip could be disastrous. It's far from a perfect example but we tried to have everything laid out so we can be quite economous with our movements. The pouring spout facing the right way, lifting with the correct hand, having the axle stand to prop up the crucible ring just so. As you see though, even with all this, there's plenty of slopping and spilling about the place. A lot of this is due to the crucible just being so full, it makes it much harder to control as well as being very heavy. You can verify this yourself just by pouring a very full jug of water. It's really in ideal what's happening here, but there is no chance for do-overs or hesitation really once you've started pouring. And I guess that counts as half a tip in itself. Stay calm and deal with the non-ideal situation as it unfolds. I've got two streams. This is the biggest casting we've done and it did require us to fill the crucible right to the Let me just interrupt myself here because Martin from Old Foundryman, the YouTube channel, has an amazing video on this very subject. And together with LuckyGen1001, they just make my piffling efforts look ridiculous. So go and check out those channels right away. <laughs> it means you'll miss the last few tips but it doesn't even matter, that's how amazing they are. Well, the pouring technique may have been absolutely sucky, but at least there was enough in the crucible to fill the mould. That's one good sign. Here's the copper pipe chill in action. 
the thing we had the steel bar. I've been told by people who would know much better that the copper pipe chill probably didn't do anything because it was separated by a couple of millimetres of sand which will have insulated it, but still it was a nice experiment. There's plenty of steam venting from the bottom there, which reminds me that I should say if you use the super shallow drag strategy, the baseboard really needs lots of holes in it or it won't vent sufficiently. They can be easily made with a hole saw. Liquid aluminium is hydroscopic, meaning it absorbs hydrogen gas when it's liquid, and the higher the temperature, the more it absorbs. When it solidifies, if there's a lot of this hydrogen, it shows up as porosity in your castings. This hydrogen comes from moisture, which can be on your casting tools or your scrap aluminium if it's not properly preheated, or it can just come from the atmosphere. It's another reason to be snappy and to keep your aluminium molten as briefly as possible, but also to avoid humid conditions. In Wales, where it can be quite wet, this means choosing dry, if potentially sweaty days. This is this is good. It's good so far, anyway. Tip 23, analyze the faults, but celebrate the successes and not in that order. In general, I am so chuffed with this. It's really flat and square for a DIY casting. It hasn't shrunk too much and the surface finish is really quite nice. Some pretty cool bits here. I don't know if you can make that out, but there's the triangular shaped piece of tape covered that hole up. Same with the other side triangular piece of tape there, you can just about make it out. The pouring basin sprue, well let's just not mention how it spilled into that one. The gating all worked quite well I think. The spin trap, I'm surprised that nothing came up the vent. I think it probably was freezing by the time it got all the way down to here. All the feeders seem to do their job, they're good and concave so that's where the shrinkage happens and you can actually see that in real time or sped up time. 2 minutes 20 seconds for a complete shrinkage. The edge furthest to the gating has a bit of a different texture to it I imagine because it was cooling compared to this side which is much finer grained and picked up the texture of the sand. This inside bit here is really nice as well and I think that's basically as good as the impression left by the pattern. Here's the main cosmetic defect, it's a rat's tail running across here and here. It's quite common on large plate surfaces where there's no ribbing to break up the area. So it's not pretty, but neither is it a structural problem. Here's the main flaw in this casting though. I think it was wall claps in the sand mould, but I'm still partially suspicious that the gate here, the closest one, froze before this area did meaning the feeder couldn't do its job on that section. Indeed, if it froze in this direction, that corner area might have ended up sort of acting like a feeder. I don't know, I welcome your suggestions. On the plus side, I think the casting's still perfectly usable. I still have the conundrum of finishing these inside edges to mount the linear rails so that I can turn this casting into a finished part for the CNC. If you want to see that happening, I'll put a link to a video as soon as it's done up there. Otherwise, Google thinks you're going to love these other videos. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.